full name for us? It's Matthew Harris. And Detective, who are you employed by? I'm employed as a detective within the Special Investigations Bureau of the Tempe Police Department. Okay. And what do your job duties include being in that unit? Uh, my primary responsibilities are technical investigations, uh, pretty much anything that involves electronics, which are wiretaps, GPS surveillance, video and audio surveillance. And what uh, training have you had in regard to those types of investigations? Um, in July 2002, I went to Fort Lauderdale, Florida for two weeks and attended a class on the basic installation of te telecommunications intercepts, which are wiretaps. I returned in August of that year for another week of uh, training. In June of 2004, I spent three days in Vegas uh, learning about GPS tracking, interpretation of the data, monitoring of the trackers. Uh, January of 2009, I went to a three-day class, or rather a two-day class, I think it was, on uh, the interpretation of cell phone records and cell tower data. In February of 2009, I took another class, same topic. It was also two days. In November of 2010, I repeated that first class on cell phone records because the instructor offered me a free seat. So I went back for a refresher. In April of 2010, I went to Tennessee for three or four days of training on the detection uh, and interception of hidden listening devices. And then in November of last year, I attended a, another class that lasted a week on the interpretation and analyzation of cell phone records and cell tower data. And how long have you been doing these types of investigations? I've been in my current position a little over 10 years. Right. And I'm assuming in addition to the training that you've had on the job experience in actually conducting these types of investigations. Yes. Throughout that 10 year period. Yes. Right. In particular, uh, with regard to phone records, have can you estimate approximately how many phone records you've looked at in your career? It would be in the hundreds. And is that one of your, uh, was that one of the duties or the jobs that you were assigned in this investigation? Yes. All right. Now, there were a number of other things you did as well, but I'm just going to take you back to the date of December 27th, 2009. Is that the date that you first became involved in this investigation? It is. All right. And what were you asked to do that day? Uh, I received a phone call from my commander, Kim Hale. Uh, I was out of town at the time. Uh, they were unable to reach my partner who was supposed to be covering for me while I was gone, but they needed some assistance in implementing a pen register trap and trace, which is essentially is a form of a wiretap. Okay, and can you explain exactly what a pen register trap and trace, what information that obtains? Yes, it, it's, it is a form of a wiretap. It's not the typical type that you might think of when you hear wiretap. We're not physically or actually listening to voice conversations between parties. All it is doing is I am electronically collecting uh, the data of phone calls uh, that are occurring between two different numbers. So if the target number or phone makes an outgoing phone call, I can immediately, and this is occurring in real time, so uh, the target phone makes a phone call, that data is going to appear on my screen immediately and it's going to show me who they're calling. It's also going to indicate at the end of the call what the duration was in a cell tower and sector of what tower was used to route that call. And at approximately what time were you asked to do this? Uh, that was, I received that phone call from Commander Hale at about 8.50 p.m. on the 27th. And whose phone were you asked to trace at that time? Uh, it was I was told to belong to uh, Elizabeth Johnson. Okay, and was that phone number 210? It was. And did you determine what provider uh, was providing service to that phone? Yes. Who was that? Cricket Communications. Now, what did you do, what did you do to actually set up the pen register trap and trace? Uh, well, because I was out of town, there wasn't a lot that I could do other than fill out what is called a CALEA cover sheet. Uh, CALEA stands for the Communication 
Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. It's essentially the federal code that covers wiretapping. Uh, each phone provider has their own CALEA cover sheet. Anytime you intercept a phone, um, you have to fill this, this piece of paper out and send it to them. And essentially what it tells them is, this is the phone number that I want to intercept. This is where I want you to send the data uh, so that I can um, monitor that and basically who to bill for it because they don't do it for free. And were you able to fill out that sheet and send it where it needed to go? Yes, I emailed it back to uh, Commander Hale. Okay. And what happened at that point? Well, what did I do at that point? Yes. I didn't do anything until I returned to work the following Monday. <laughs> All right. Now, were you advised as to what had occurred with the trap and trace during that time frame? Yeah, my, uh, they eventually were able to get in touch with my partner at the time. I, I did receive a phone call from him that night uh, stating that he was on his way over to the Mesa Police Department. This is where I had instructed Cricket communica Communications to send the data for the pen register trap and trace. He was on his way over there to monitor uh, the tap to see whether any data came in and hopefully give us uh, information as to where Elizabeth, Elizabeth Johnson was located. Um, however, uh, he subsequently learned that the phone had been powered off, either physically turned off or the battery had died, and therefore we were not getting any information at all uh, on the pen register trap and trace. Okay. So when you returned to work, what date was that? Uh, Monday, January 4th, I believe it was. Okay, and is that the next time that you were uh, you conducted investigation into this matter? Yes. What did you do on January 4th? Uh, other, uh, I attended a meeting and got a little, was updated a bit on uh, information about the investigation while I was gone. Um, but then I was also provided some call detail records that had been that had been obtained for Elizabeth Johnson's cell phone. Okay, and were those obtained by a different detective? Yes, I believe they were obtained by Detective Elliot Campbell, who was my partner at the time. Okay, and did you do anything with those cell phone records? Yes, I did a cell tower analysis of the calls that occurred on December 27th. And were those done utilizing the records that had been provided by Cricket at that time? For the 27th, yes. For the, for the date of December 27th only at that time? Yes. All right, and when you did a cell phone tower analysis, can you explain to the jury how it is that you do that? Um, typically, the records will come to me in a uh, Excel spreadsheet. There will be numerous columns on there. It'll, a lot of it will look like phone numbers. But it will indicate a date and a time a call occurred, um, who the, the, uh, whether it was an incoming or an outgoing call, how long the call lasted, but most importantly in a scenario like this is the cell tower data. So each call will have uh, typically a cell tower uh, column indicating that this is the cell tower that was either used to route the outgoing call from the target phone or to deliver the incoming call to the target phone. There's another list that I'll have. Uh, also an Excel spreadsheet that will list all the cell tower locations for particular cell providers, cell towers. So I would take the number that is, cell tower number that is listed in the call detail records, go to the cell tower list, find the corresponding cell tower, and then via the longi longitude and latitude that is listed in that cell tower list, I would plot that on a map. And in this case, I used uh, Microsoft St Streets and Trips. Sorry, Microsoft. Streets and Trips. It's a mapping program. Okay, and when you did that cell phone tower analysis, did you create a chart um, of the towers that had been utilized by that phone number on December 27th? Yes, I did. All right, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing what's marked as Exhibit 123. Do you recognize this document? Yes, this and is the chart or the map that I prepared on for the 27th of uh, the cell towers that were utilized. Does it use 
Exhibit 123 at this time. Any objection? No objection, Judge. Exhibit 123 is admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. Detective, I believe uh, you've already indicated that this is the cell phone tower analysis you did on December 27th, well, for the date of December 27th, 2009. And essentially, this document shows a map of, the, of a portion of the state of Texas, correct? Yes, that indicates between uh, San Antonio to the east of Houston. And I note that there are a number of dialog boxes uh, with numbers on the map. Um, can you explain what each of those represent? Each of the uh, dialog boxes indicate in the very top line is the cell tower number that was used to route a particular call or series of calls. Uh, below that indicates the date the call occurred, the time at which it occurred, and then um, the, it indicates it will say out for an outbound call and then a dash in who that call was to, or it'll say in with a dash and who that incoming call was from. And then the bottom line is just the latitude and longitude of that location of that particular cell tower. There's also uh, text boxes that have numbers in them labeled one through uh, whatever they go up to. Um, that it sequentially indicates throughout the day on the 27th and this what you can see there is number one that was the first call made on the 27th from Elizabeth Johnson's phone number box two will indicate the next tower that was used in the calls that occurred while she was utilizing that tower three four and so on throughout the day okay. so it sequentially indicates and as you can see when you can see the whole map it'll indicate you can see how the progresses uh, eastbound towards Houston. All right, and starting with box number one, um, you this chart indicates that tower number 92 was utilized in making this phone call? Yes, uh, that is what that indicates in, that's not how it looks in the cell tower records. I've ex taken ex some extraneous information off of there, but tower 92 was the tower that was used. All right, and I, I know you explained uh, what each line means, but I want to talk in detail about each call that was made on this chart. Okay. Um, this one is indicated, it's call number one on that date. Yes. Of December 27th, 2009, correct? Yes. And it was made at 8.57 hours? Yes. Which is 8.57 in the morning, correct? Correct. And it was an outgoing call to the Tornado Bus Company? Yes. <clears throat> now we go down to call number two. And can you please indicate, well, actually, it's not call number two. It's just location number two or Ta the tower. tower number two. All right. Can you please explain the calls that were made um, utilizing this tower? Okay. On the 27th, um, at 1147 hours or 1147 in the morning, uh, the next call occurred on Elizabeth Johnson's phone. It was an incoming call from Tammy Smith. Uh, there were no more calls until 1256 hours, at which time she received an incoming call from Logan McQuarrie. At 1258 hours, another call was received from Logan McQuarrie. And then at 1308 hours, uh, Elizabeth made an outbound call to Logan McQuarrie. And, and all of those calls were routed using tower number 82. Okay. And, uh then we have tower number three here. Could you please outline what calls were made utilizing that tower? Yes. Um, and I haven't listed the individual calls. I've listed from 1309 hours or 109 in the afternoon until 121 in the afternoon. There were 30 outbound calls to Logan from Elizabeth. All of the durations were under 15 seconds. Okay. And does uh, that signify anything to you, the fact that they were all under 15 seconds? Uh, well, I, I believe that you probably had this phone turned off. Uh, or you just it was going immediately or very quickly to voicemail, and he was not answering the call. And then cell or tower number 125 indicated in box four. What call is indicated at that time? 
that was at 2.52 in the afternoon on the 27th, and it's an incoming call from one of our Tempe Police Sergeants, Sergeant Lenzen. And just looking at the times and the direction, it appears that from the cell phone towers, who the phone is being used traveling in a south and then an eastward direction from the first call? Yes. Uh, uh, the first call, she traveled south to Tower 82. 82 happens to be within a very close distance to the Tornado Bus Company. The next tower, 71, is slightly north and east of the last tower and also the Tornado Bus Company. And then clearly uh, from the, uh, the fourth um, tower, you can see that the, the phone is migrating to the east. And then we have uh, number five on this chart. Could you indicate what is being, what is occurring during this time utilizing that cell phone tower? Uh, what I've listed there is at 3.10 p.m., uh, 3.11 p.m., and 3.30 p.m., uh, Elizabeth initiated what is called a WAP session. Uh, WAP is an acronym for Web Access Portal. And all that means is that she was utilizing her cell phone in some fashion to access the Internet. And then is there a phone call placed at that time? In between uh, the second and the last of the WAP sessions, there was an outbound call to Malcolm Phipps. And then box number six, what does that indicate? Six indicates that, uh, again, at 337 and 339 in the afternoon, uh, two more WAP sessions occurred. And again, this is the cell phone towers are in an, going in an eastward direction. Correct. Still. And box number seven. Uh, Sixteen or four eighteen in the afternoon. There is an outbound call to Soren. Stanescu, I think is how you pronounce it. Okay. And then box number eight. Eight uh, is tower number 197 at 449 hours in the afternoon, and she, Elizabeth, received an incoming call from Soren Stanescu, or Stanescu. And then finally, we have box number nine on this chart. At 7.09 p.m., an outbound call was placed to Soren Stanescu, and again, an outbound call at 7.29 p.m. Now, were you able to obtain further information um, regarding, well, once you made this chart, what did you do next? Well, we ended up getting, it was determined that at the time these records were obtained, um, Detective Campbell did not realize that uh, Elizabeth had been in San Antonio uh, for almost a week prior to uh, the date of these records, and he ended up getting the entire set of records from, uh, I believe it was December 24th through the 27th. Um, Actually, in the, the last call that you saw on that map was the last call made uh, from the phone um, early in the hours of, in the early morning hours of the 28th, uh, the phone was either powered off or the battery went dead, and there was no more um, calls made or received from that phone after that date or that time. Now, you indicated that the te Detective Campbell obtained additional phone records of that cricket phone that was being used in San Antonio, correct? Yes. Okay. And did he obtain them from the dates of December 21st, 2009 to December 27th, 2009? Yes. All right. And did you conduct another cell phone tower analysis utilizing the phone numbers that were called at that time? I did. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you Exhibit 124. And do you recognize that? I do. And what is it? It's another chart or map of the cell towers that were used by Elizabeth Johnson's phone uh, between the 21st and the 27th, only in the San Antonio area only. Is it 
Vehicle Centered Evidence, Exhibit 124. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 124 is admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. Just as a general overview, um, I believe in the in the middle, middle of the map here it says San Antonio. So this is your cell phone tower analysis just in the San Antonio area between those dates, correct? Correct. All right. And we'll start at the top. This first box here on the left that indicates indicates home gate suites, what, what does that signify? That is the hotel that uh, it had been learned Elizabeth was staying at uh, during her time in San Antonio. And uh, I believe directly next to it, there is a box that in indicates tower number 92. What does that signify? That is cell tower 92 for cricket communications and the location uh, indicated by the red dot of where that tower is at in proximity to the hotel she was staying at. And you have the date of 12-21-09 to 12-27-09 and a caption of various times. What does that mean? It means that that tower was used to either route calls to or from Elizabeth's phone during those dates at various times. There was too many calls to, to list them, but every day she was in San Antonio, she hit that tower. Okay. And in, um, you're indicating various times instead of listing all the separate phone calls that were made, correct? Yes. Now we're going to go down a little bit here to Tower 105, and what does that indicate? Uh, that was a call utilizing Tower number 105 on December 22nd of 2009. Uh, and apparently there were two calls, one at 1521 and one at 1523 or 323 in the afternoon. Okay. And then we have Tower number 86. Uh, Two more calls, utilizing a different tower on the 22nd, uh, number 86. Uh, two calls occurring at uh, 1249 in the afternoon and again at 217 in the afternoon. Okay, and then coming over here, we have tower number 74. That indicates a call that occurred on the 21st of uh, December at 219 in the afternoon. And then we go down here towards the bottom of the map. And in particular, you have the Tornado Bus Company, um, the, its location indicated on the map, correct? Yes, on this map, I, I did indicate where the Tornado Bus Company was in proximity to. And was there information that Elizabeth Johnson had used that bus company at that location? Uh, there was information later determined after I found this phone call that uh, was followed up on and indicated she had. All right. And Tower 71, what does that indicate? Uh, 71 indicates, and this is actually uh, one of the calls that we went over on the previous map, but uh, this is uh, two calls occurring at 109 in the afternoon on the 27th and another at uh, 121 hours. And then Tower 82? Is, uh, and I, actually it may, I may have spoken correctly on the last one. There may have been more than two calls occurring there because I'm just saying between these hours calls occurred. Okay. Uh, the same with Tower 82 from 11.47 in the morning until 1.08 in the afternoon. There were calls occurring on Tower 82. Eighth, two 2010 moving forward during this investigation did you were you asked to do something that day I'm gonna have to refer to my report okay. when your memories were fresh well one of the things that I did on uh, the 8th was obtain some phone records for uh, known phones of uh, Logan McQuarrie as well as a previous phone uh, that Elizabeth had been known to use. And were those all under the account? Um, were they in, in, an, in an associated account between the two parties? 
as, as I recall, there were free, three phones on Logan McQuarrie's account. Uh, one of those was a phone that he uh, had indicated Elizabeth used uh, as her phone while they were together. Now, in following up in this investigation, did you obtain certified records from the various co phone companies of the parties involved in this case? I did. Okay, specifically, did you receive certified phone records uh, for the phone numbers used by Logan McQuarrie and Elizabeth Johnson? I did. And are those from Cricket? The, yes. And did you obtain certified phone records from Verizon regarding Tammy Smith and Jack Smith? Yes. Okay, as well as an individual by the name of Janet Morris? Yes. Did you also attempt to obtain, well, did you obtain any text record, text message records from Cricket? No, Cricket uh, Communications does not retain the uh, content of a text message. If I was to send a message to one of you saying whatever, they would not be able to provide whatever I said to you uh, back to me at a later date. They would be able to tell me that on this date at this time I did t send a text message to you, but they couldn't tell me what the content of that message was. And in regards to the records uh, received from Verizon records, are, were you able to obtain content from Verizon? Yes, Verizon does retain the content of text messages, but it's time sensitive. Uh, at some point, if, if that's something that we know we're going to need in an investigation, we need to get it right away. Uh, because as time goes on, uh, the earlier texts are going to start to be purged. Okay. So with regard to Tammy Smith's text record messages, were you only able to obtain them during a certain time frame? Yes. And did that begin on December 24th of 2009? Yes, it did. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you... what's marked as Exhibit 35. And Detective, can you please tell us what that is? Uh, these are the certified cricket records for Elizabeth Johnson's phone number 210. And three phone numbers of Logan McQuarrie, uh, the numbers being 48. And those are all written on the front of that envelope, correct? Yes, and, and that's in my handwriting. The state moves to enter into evidence Exhibit 35. Do you need to take a look at it? No, Judge, no, Judge. Exhibit 35 is admitted. Okay, and I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit 36. <coughs> what does that contain? These are certified phone records for Jack Smith uh, with a phone number ending in 51. And it's CDRs. It's called CDRs, um, called detail records, and text content. The state moves to enter into evidence Exhibit 36 at this time. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 36 is admitted. And I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit 37.001 and 38.001. Do you recognize those documents? Uh, yes, I do. And what are those documents? These are certified uh, Verizon call detail records for Tammy Smith uh, with a phone number ending in 1. And specifically, uh, do those certify the phone calls and the text messages that were utilized, that were placed on that cell phone number? Yes. State moves to enter into evidence at this time. 
Exhibit 37.001 and 38.001. Any objection? No objection. Exhibits 37.001 and 38.001 are admitted. Again, Your Honor, yeah. I'm showing you Exhibit 43. Do you recognize what is contained in that folder? This is the certification for the phone records of uh, Janet Morris, phone number ending in three. State moves to enter into evidence at this time, Exhibit 43. Any objection? Exhibit 43 is admitted. Okay, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the cricket records of Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you exhibits 44 and 45. Recognize what's in Exhibit 44? Yes. And what is contained in that exhibit? These are the call detail records for Elizabeth Johnson's phone, uh, ending in 3843, in uh, December 21st. And the actual last noted call is on December 28th. For her phone, and then there's also one page document that are certification of text data records, and by that I mean just this number texted this number, no content. And exhibit 45, do you recognize what's within that folder? These are the certification of uh, one of Logan McQuarrie's phones ending in 7 uh, It runs from November 14th of 2009. Ending in seven years ago from January 14th, 2009 to December 21st, 2009. And it looks like second set of records that go from for the same phone number that go from December 22nd of 09 to January 1st of 2010. Any objection? No objection. Exhibits 44 and 45 are admitted. You may. 
Now I'm showing you uh, the first page in Exhibit 44, and these are the cricket records of Elizabeth Johnson. And I believe you indicated that um, this page documents the text messages that were either sent to or received by this phone. Is that correct? Correct. And if we start in this column here, it gives the date of the message, or the date that the message was sent, correct? Yes. Um, the originating address, which would be the originating phone number? That would be the person, or the phone number sending the text. Okay. So if um, it had been sent from this phone directly, would that phone number appear in that column? Would you repeat that? If it had been sent from the phone number ending in 384, that's would, what that that is the number that would appear in the originating column. Correct? Yes, if it was an outgoing text. Okay, and if it was an incoming text, then a different number would appear there. Yes. Right. And then the destination is if it's an outgoing text, it'll show the number that it was texted to. That they were sending, yeah, that that target phone was sending a text to. Right. And then, what do these numbers and these columns mean? And. Uh, those might I, I can't tell you without looking at the instructions to interpret these. Uh, it may just be how many digits were in the text or how okay. the length of the text. All right. And then looking at this is uh, page one of four that is stapled together in this exhibit. And are these the actual calls that were placed or received by this phone? Those are the call detail records uh, for Elizabeth Johnson's phone. Okay, and I believe up here it indicates from December 21st, 2009 to December 26, 2009. Yes. Okay. But actually looking at the records, it goes through the 28th, correct? Yes. Now, obviously, just to have a, uh, an explanation of the columns in here, the destination number, is that the number that was dialed by this phone? It might be. Okay. Um, Cricket Communications has the worst call detail records to do analysis on. There are at least, uh, well, I'm counting three columns and actually four columns that have numbers in them that appear to be phone numbers. Um, the destination address should be the number of an outbound call, but it may not be. There may be some routing information in there that looks like a 10-digit phone number or network activity or something like that. So you can't just look at the numbers. In an example of that, the third line down, there's a, the, the number preceded by 11. That's telling me that that's network data. It's not an actual phone call. So is it more, is it, more reliable to use the dialed number to interpret what number <laughs> no, was dialed. it's not uh, because routing data can appear in that column as well. You almost have to view these in totality. Uh, you can't look at it in one column really and figure out what exactly is happening for sure uh, without putting some thought into it. And a little bit later we'll talk about this and we'll look at it, but did you in fact compile another exhibit which contains an indication of who was placing what call to whom? Yes, and uh, what, the same document, all I did, because this came in an Excel spreadsheet, I was able to add a, another column uh, where I typed in uh, some text. in the cricket records of Logan McQuarrie, correct? The same type of documents? Yeah, it would be the same column or headings, yes. Now, 
May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Showing you exhibit 39 at this time. Uh, these are called detail records for Tammy Smith's telephone, cell phone ending in 1887 from December 1st, December 30th, 2009. There's also a Verizon cell tower list in here. Okay. State moves to enter into evidence at this time, Exhibit 39. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 39 is admitted. I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit 42. Do you recognize what is within that folder? These are the uh, call detail records for Jack Smith. His phone number ending in... December 20th, 2009, and January 3rd, 2010. Thank you. The state moves to enter into evidence Exhibit 42. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 42 is admitted. And I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit 46. Do you recognize what's within that folder? Yeah, these are the phone records of uh, Tammy Smith, Elizabeth Johnson, and Logan McQuarrie, where I have added a column with text uh, typed in by me. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 46 is admitted. And within this document, or within this folder in Exhibit 46, Detective, this is the one we were talking about a little bit earlier where you added a column on the right-hand side of the page would be column L on this particular record to show who was making the call and who was receiving the call, correct? Correct. Okay. And in particular, in this, on page 33 of 49, you're indicating that Logan made a call to Tammy Smith. Yes. Okay, and if you go across the column, to the left, you're able to tell what date and time that call was placed, correct? Yes. And within this folder, well, this folder, I just want to back up a little bit. This folder contains all the records that are in the previous exhibits, correct? Yes. And they're just compiled into one folder with notations as to who the calls or texts are between. Yes. All right. And this right here in particular, this is Elizabeth Johnson's text message records text during this detail. time frame. Yes. Yeah. All right. And I believe down here you're indicating there's a text from Elizabeth to Tammy on 1222. Yes. Uh, another on the same day. 
Correct. Um, on the same day, a couple minutes later, it's Tammy to Elizabeth, and so forth. Yes. Now, within these cricket document, within the cricket phone records, there are some things that are particular to cricket, correct? How they document calls being made or received? Yes. Okay, and you've made a notation in this exhibit. Can you explain that a little bit for the jury? Well, blow that up a little bit so they can read the notation. Thank the you. way, sorry. The way uh, Cricket's system is set up is when we were, uh, law enforcement requests call detail records, they're extracting raw, well, actually, they're doing an interpretation of raw phone data that's extracted from their system. Consequently, what happens is if you have two Cricket uh, phones communicating with one another and you're asking for records on only one of those Cricket phones, you will still receive any calls between the two. You will still receive the other side of the record for the other phone in the record you're requesting. So if if I had, if Miss Ramuno and I both had cricket phones and I called her and then subpoenaed my own records, when I made that call to her, there's going to be a line of data in my records that is actually pertains to her side of the conversation. So one phone call, but there's two lines of data. What complicated it in this case is Logan McQuarrie is in Arizona. Elizabeth Johnson was in San Antonio. We're in a different time zone. So instead of seeing two lines, one right after the another, you know, the Logan side of the call, the Elizabeth side of the call, you have to go, you have to, anything that Logan did, you have to look and add an hour to it to see the corresponding call in Elizabeth records. Consequently, if you're looking at Elizabeth records and it's something involving Logan, you have to go an hour back in the records to see his side of the call. It'd be nice if Cricket could just, you know, get rid of that extraneous data for phones that don't pertain exactly to what you're asking for. But what I've done in, in this exhibit here is um, any lines of data where um, that pertain to phone records for other than Elizabeth Johnson's phone, I bolded that text. Um, so everything that you're seeing there, if you zoom out on that a little bit, this is these bolded phone calls here in bold, and then you can see in uh, uh, kind of a parenthesis off to the right, I've made a note, that bolded uh, lines of data, those are all records that shouldn't appear in Elizabeth's records, but they do because of the way Cricket maintains their data. Those are actually phone records for Logan's phone, not Elizabeth's. Same down further, you're going to see a lot of lines of data there that are bolded. Those records pertain to Elizabeth, or I'm sorry, Logan McQuarrie's side of the phone call. Another way that you can distinguish the two is Logan McQuarrie's phone number appears, if you could scroll down or back up, I'm sorry. Uh, if Logan McQuarrie's phone number appears in that customer phone column, um, then that, that, that line of data pertains to his phone records and not Elizabeth's. There is a corresponding record in there for Elizabeth's side of the conversation, but everything in bold is, is not uh, a record, a true record of Elizabeth Johnson's activity. It's essentially, it's a duplicate. Okay, so you've indicated, um, if any, for anyone looking at these records, that in this particular phone record, which pertains to Elizabeth Johnson's phone number, if it's in bold, that is actually Logan McQuarrie's records. Or another Cricket customer. Or another Cricket customer. So the unbolded portions are the ones that were actually activity, the activity on Elizabeth Johnson's phone. Yes. Located within all of these phone records, there are hundreds of phone numbers, correct? 
in all of them? Yes. I'd say there's thousands. Okay. And as part of your investigation, did you go through all the phone numbers and identify who those phone numbers were associated with? Uh, well, not all of them, but many of them. Okay. And as far as the phone numbers that you were able to identify who they belong to, did you create a chart of that information? Yes, a spreadsheet. Okay. And the spreadsheet, actually there's two. One is uh, labeled attachment 19, is that correct? Yes. Right. And those numbers are sorted alphabetically by the owner of the phone number? Yes. Okay. And then did you also create a spreadsheet in attachment 20 where the numbers are sorted numerically? Yes. So you can look up the number and find who owns it one way in one attachment or in the other attachment you can look up the name the name and find the and phone identify number. the phone. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? May. I'm showing you exhibit These are, these are the charts that I made, or the spreadsheets. The state moves center and evidence exhibit 125. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 125 is admitted. Now, you testified earlier, detective, about obtaining the text message records from Tammy Smith's phone. Is that correct? Yes. And because Verizon um, actually captures the content of the text messages, those are contained in these records. Is that correct? Yes. All right. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you Exhibit 126. These are Verizon text message content records for Tammy Smith's phone on December 27th, 2009. The state moves to enter into evidence at 126. Any objection? Yes, we need to see this one very It's on the way over to you. Exhibit 126 is admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? You may. Okay, Detective, um, just so we can decipher what all this writing means here, I'm going to start with this text message up at the top here. <clears throat> do these dates indicate, do any of these dates indicate the date the text was actually sent? Yes. And which line is that? Uh, okay, this is an outgoing text from Tammy Smith. This, this message was actually sent at uh, 9.50 and 18 seconds on the 27th. Okay. And you know that it was sent from Tammy Smith by looking at this number here? Yes. The, the, if they're in the uh, row of data that it says originator, that is the person or the phone number sending the message. Okay. And uh, this one says Merry Christmas? Yes. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Call me, girl. Okay. And the next text down, um, what is the date and time that this text was sent? At 10.50, 10.50 a.m. and 24 seconds. Okay. And for the record, I believe we've already stated this, but these are all from December 27th, correct? Yes. All right. And who is this text message sent to? 
uh, the row of data that indicates terminating DN, that is the person who was sent, or the message was sent to, and the phone number listed in this example is Elizabeth Johnson's. Okay. And what does this text <coughs> state? It says, uh, everything is okay, question mark. I've tried calling you, and it keeps disconnecting. Okay. And does Elizabeth Johnson respond at 12.08? Yes. Okay. And what is the response? Uh, no, I'm not okay, period. I am upset and scared, period. Okay. And does Tammy Smith respond to that text at 12.09? Yes. And what is the response? Call me. Call me. I'm here for you. Now, the next, test, the next text message, the content is not on, on this page, but it was sent uh, at 1210? Yes. Okay. And that was sent from Tammy Smith to Elizabeth Johnson? Yes. <clears throat> and what is the content of that text? Uh, it says, what's going on now? Has someone, or has, has done something? <laughs> okay. And at 1223... Is there another message from Tammy to Elizabeth? Yes. And what does that state? Please call me. I'm worried about you. I have something about my past that I want to tell you. You are more. We are more alike than you'll ever know. Please call me. Okay. And does Elizabeth respond at 1233? Yes. And what does that state? I hate myself. I can never do anything right. And what is, does Tammy Smith respond at 1235? Yes. And what is that response? It says, yes, you can. I was just like you many years ago until I met Jack. He built up my confidence and supported me in whatever I wanted to do. He changed my life and... Does it continue at that time? Yeah, and in, in the next message it continues. Okay. We can help you change your life and finally be happy and secure. I had an effed up life and thought I was just a piece of shit made by my parents, but they don't. And does it continue as well? It yeah. appears to 12, continue. 12.39, okay. Define me anymore, and your past doesn't have to define you either. Come home and stay with us. We'll open a bottle of red wine. Parenthetically, that's what I drink and talk. Okay. And does Elizabeth respond at 1240? Yes. And? It says it's too late for me, uh -huh. and then the rest is blacked out. Okay. And at 1240, is there a response from Tammy Smith? Yes. And what does she say? No, you're not. Who said that? And at... 1241, does Elizabeth then respond to Tammy? Yes. And what does she say? Uh, your lawyer told me that yesterday. And at 1241, does Tammy respond? Yes. And what does she state? My lawyer can shoot, question mark. Okay. And at 1243, does Elizabeth respond? Yes. And what does that response say? I can't come back. I won't go to jail. I'd rather die. Plus, you could get charged with aiding and embedding. And at 1227, is there another response by Elizabeth at 1243? Yes. And what is that response? No, the girl won. And then is there a text from Tammy to Elizabeth at 1310? Yes. And what does she state? I just got off the phone with my <laughs> lawyer, Ken. Uh, then in parentheses, I think it's, by the way, that girl isn't an attorney. She just works with them, end of parentheses. He said, since you never got served, you don't have to show tomorrow, but you will. And then is there another text from Tammy at 1312? Yes. Okay. 
And what does that indicate? Have to show for the next hearing. The, ju the judge may be mad at you, but not much, but not do much, but yell at you. My attorney will explain all the threats and smooth it over tomorrow. We'll let you know. And is there another text from Tammy at 1312 or 112 in the afternoon? Yes. And what does that state? Uh, what the judge said tomorrow and our attorney will call you after court to tell you. And is there a response at 1313 from Elizabeth? Yes. <clears throat> and what does it state? Okay. And then does Tammy make another comment to Elizabeth at that, at 1314. Yes. What does it state? Everything's fine as long as you make it to the ne next hearing after tomorrow. Uh, space and s semicolon, not sure what D slash N, uh, something cheer up. Okay. <clears throat> and does Elizabeth respond at 1331 or 131? Yes. And what does she state? No, I don't plan on going, so don't. I'm just going to stay in hiding. And does Elizabeth, res I'm sorry, does Tammy respond at 1334? Yes. <clears throat> what does she state? Wow, I will pray for you. You are making a huge mistake. We are willing to help you if you do the right thing, but we can't help you break the law. You are not in trouble yet. And does she text Elizabeth again at 1338? Yes. And what does she state there? What happens if he gets sick or in two years breaks an arm or something? You can't take him to a hospital. You're making me cry for him and you too. We love you both. And at 1420, does Tammy text Elizabeth again? Yes. And what does she state there? You need to call me. I need to hear Gabriel cry, even if you have to pinch him. The police called me and listened to a message from you saying you killed Gabriel. Please call ASAP. And at 1425 or 225, um, is there a response from Elizabeth? Yes. Kane, what does she state? I'm driving. I'm driving. A have no reception. Yeah, I texted Logan that to hurt him and mess with him, to get back at him. Call keeps dropping. And at 1428 or 228, does Tammy respond? Yes. What does she state? Can you please call me when you have reception so I can hear him, so everyone knows he's okay? Are you on the run? Can you at least call the police here? And does Elizabeth respond at 1431? <clears throat> yes. And what does it state? They already called, and we got disconnected. My cell doesn't have good reception unless I'm in a city, but I will try. And does Tammy respond okay at 1432? <clears throat> yes. Now, starting on page 8 of the records in this case, um, are there text messages, well, let's look at this one right here, December 27th, 2009 at 1825, which is 625 in the evening? Correct. All right. Now, this text message here um, indicates that it originates from Tammy Smith's number. Yes. And it is sent to a 480 number. Yes. And did you determine who that 480 number belongs to? Yes. And who does that belong to, or did at the time? Yeah, that, that phone number uh, uh, belonged at the time to uh, Detective Frank Aguilera within okay. our department. Now, we've already had testimony um, regarding the fact that Tammy Smith had texted some previous messages to Detective Aguilera. Does this confirm that that's what happened in these records? Yes, that's exactly what's happening. <clears throat> okay, so these are previous text messages that are being forwarded 
to Detective Aguilera? Yes, that were stored on Tammy Smith's phone. She is sending them on to Detective Aguilera. All right, and they were sent on December 27th from Tammy Smith's phone. But from these records, we don't know when the original message was sent or received. Is that a fair statement? From these records, right. at least. Yeah, exactly. Now, we do have, there is other information or other sources of these texts that are able to document when those texts were received. Yes. Okay, and those are from the cell phones, pictures taken from Logan McCreary's phone and Elizabeth Johnson's phone. Is that correct? Yes, to my knowledge. All right. So this text here indicates, can you read what this text states? <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. That was a question. Uh, hey, it's Elizabeth. I'm sorry. I was going to call, but you have been scared. We are all right, though I can't talk right now. What serious information do I need to... And what is the next uh, line here? The continuing text the message is no. Okay, and again on page 9, we are still continuing with the texts that are forwarded from Tammy Smith to Detective Aguilera, correct? Yes. All right. And... Um, This one appears, no, to be a repeat of the previous text, correct? There's two, there's two entries that state no. Yeah, they're exactly at the same time. Oh, right. no, they're not. Okay. Yes, I, I would agree with that. So does that indicate Tammy must have sent it twice? Yeah, okay. that's what it appears to have, to have happened. And uh, her response then, call me, it's too much to tell over a text, we will not judge you, just call me? Yes. Okay. Now this one here that is sent at 1826 is another one from Tammy Smith to Detective Aguilera, correct? Yes. And in this one, it's, could you read that one into the record, please? You want me to read that full number? Yes. Six one five. The number to my friend Janet Morris in Tennessee. Call her. She can give you all the legal advice you need to know. Then call me and we'll talk, Tammy. Okay. And then this is another one that was forwarded to Detective Aguilera, stating, "Is everything okay? I've tried calling you and it keeps disconnecting." Correct. And then there's some here just showing that a message has been delivered, but it's not showing a content of a message. Yes. Okay. And then this one here, again, at 1827, is being sent to Detective Aguilera. Yes. Okay, and it says, no, I'm not. I'm, up, I'm not okay. I'm upset and scared. Correct. And that's one that we've seen previously. It is. Okay. beyond noon so we can finish and don't have to bring you back over, over lunch. If anybody needs a break, let me know. Otherwise, we're going to push through. Okay, and then going through, now we're up to page 19 of the records in this exhibit. And at 1830, there's another text from Tammy to Detective Aguilera. And this appears to be one that we've seen earlier, too. I just got off the phone with my lawyer, Ken. By the way, that girl's an attorney. She just works with them. Correct. Okay. All right. And then we're at page 20. And at 1831, Tammy forwards another message to Detective Aguilera. And we've seen this one before as well. Everything's fine as long as you make it to the next hearing after tomorrow, so cheer up. Correct. Okay. And then we have one that we haven't seen before. At 1831, Tammy forwards one to Detecca Aguilera that states, keep your hotel receipts, though. Yes. 
And there's a response, why? Again, this is forwarded to Detective Aguilera? Yes. Okay. And then at 1831, another response forwarded to Aguilera that states, if you're coming back for the second hearing, you can stay here till you want to, but I don't want them thinking you were here before the first court hearing or before the first court date because I told thee, and then it appears to continue, police, Logan, and court, you weren't. Correct. And then at page 23, it appears that we are still looking at messages forwarded from Tammy Smith to Detective Aguilera. You need to call me. I need to hear Gabriel cry, even if you have to pinch him. And we've seen that one previously when it was originally sent, correct? Yes. Okay, now I, that continues through page 29 where Tammy is forwarding messages to Aguilera, correct? Because here at page 29 we have Tammy Smith to Detective Aguilera. Yes. Okay. And she forwards him a message. That And what does that message read? Uh, can we get together tomorrow morning to talk with you and your dad? I'm afraid she'll be gone forever because she doesn't want to go to jail for kidnapping. She, and then it continues on the next message. Doesn't trust you or your dad. The only way she'll come back is if my attorney faxes the signed papers to her and she won't get in trouble and Gabriel be with us. And then continuing on to page 30, this is another message forwarded from Tammy Smith to Detective Aguilera. Yes. And what does this message state? No, Monday when she fails to appear in the and the judge will issue a warrant for arrest. Anyone who has helped her will be subject to arrest as an accessory and says one of two and they are going to issue an Amber Alert for Elizabeth and the baby. I am not signing any adoption paperwork. And then it appears that there are additional messages that are delivered but no content. I think that's just network data. I don't okay. think it's a, like a message that we didn't get content for. Okay. And then this is also another message forwarded to Detective Aguilera? Yes. And what does this message state? Uh, it says, I want my son. And then... This next message here that starts on page 31 and continues to 32 well, was forwarded to Detective Aguilera at approximately 1852? Yes. Okay, and what does the content of that message state? I will tell her this. I understand. We will pray about it. I hope she does the right thing. Let us, let us know if we can do anything. God bless. pluck out some things that you've already testified to for the purpose of highlighting um, that to the jury, if that's okay. Okay. Would it be fair to say that uh, based on your investigation, we are able to put together a timeline, uh, dates, times uh, of things like where Elizabeth Johnson was on certain days and times, who she called, who she sent texts to, who she received texts from? Yeah. Okay. Assuming that she was one of the one in possession of the phone. That's what I was going to ask you next. Um, all of this is entirely dependent on an assumption, of course, that Elizabeth Johnson is indeed the person 
who has in her possession that phone. Isn't that right? It is. And of course, uh, it's based on an assumption that she's the one who's using the phone as well. That is correct. And you don't have any uh, information uh, to either uh, support or uh, deny that issue, do you? Whether or not she was the person who actually was holding the phone in those days and times. Do I have any information to verify that she was the one holding the phone? Yeah, in at Texas. The at the time of those calls? Yeah. Uh, I could not answer that. I could not tell you that. Well, it's, true, it's true that you don't have information to oh, verify. Okay, yeah, that is true. I don't have def information that she was definitively the one making those calls other than her being in possession of the phone. Okay, so Later. assuming that Elizabeth Johnson is indeed the person holding the phone, using the phone, for purposes of your analysis and these questions, we could conclude with certainty then, um, could we not, that Elizabeth Johnson was at the Home Gate Suites in Texas at least between the dates of December 21st, 2009 and December 27th, 2009. Based on the cell phone records? Based on all the records, everything you just went through. I, I can't, from those records, I can't say she was at the Homegate Suites. Now, there's other information that we know she was. All the phone records tell me is that she was, she used a tower, a cell tower, every day of the week that she was known to be in Texas that was very near the Homegate Suites. Fair enough, and I, and I appreciate the answer. So would it be accurate to say, uh, assuming Elizabeth Johnson was the person in possession of the phone, that Elizabeth Johnson was either at or around the Homegate Suites in Texas between December 21st, 2009 and December 27, 2009? Well, I know from other information that she was at the Homegate Suites okay. during that period. So we can, we can conclude that with some reasonable amount of certainty, can't we? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. And then on December 27, 2009, let's talk about that day for a moment. There was a lot of testimony about that day on your direct. you recall that? Yes. Okay. Can we conclude with a reasonable amount of certainty that Elizabeth Johnson was at the Tornado bus station or around the Tornado bus station in Texas about 8.57 a.m. on December 27 of 09? No. Why can't we conclude that? She called the Tornado bus company at 8.57, but she was on a tower next to the Homegate Suites. Okay, and how far apart are those two places? Uh, I don't know specifically, but it appears from the map to be several miles. Okay, fair enough. So at 8.57, Elizabeth Johnson made a call on 12.27.09 to the Tornado bus station. Yes. Okay. And she, that call, she was in or around San Antonio, Texas. Would that be accurate? At the time of that call, she was in San Antonio, Texas. There's no disputing that. No disputing that. At 11.47 a.m., Elizabeth Johnson receives a call from Tammy Smith. Can we agree on that? Okay, I don't, I don't have the map up there to verify that, but I believe that is correct, yes. Okay, and for that call, she is at uh, or near Tower 82, which is the Tornado bus station. Correct. Okay, so we can conclude with a reasonable amount of certainty that on December 27, 2009 at 1147, Elizabeth Johnson is either at the Tornado bus station or around the Tornado bus station? Yes. Okay. And then at same day, at 12.53 p.m., Elizabeth Johnson sends a text message to Logan McQuarrie that says, quote, I killed him. Can we agree on that? What was the date and the time again? At 12.53 p.m., December 27, 2009. I don't remember talking about that in my earlier testimony, but um, I, I know a text like that was sent. I just don't know the date. I can't confirm the date and the time it was sent. Do you recall if that was from Tower 82 at the Tornado bus station? A text message? Yeah. I remember a phone call. I'm going there next. But okay. can you remember from your recollection, based on your investigation in this case, do you remember that text message? I know a text like that was sent. I, I can't tell you at what time or what date it was sent on. Okay, so going to something that you testified about on direct, at 12.56 p.m., December 27, 2009, there was a phone call that Elizabeth Johnson received from Logan McQuarrie. Do you recall that? 
Not with looking at the without the records. I can't remember specific phone calls, dates, and times. You're going to have to. All right, we're going to have to give you the exhibit. I was hoping we could do without, but I guess we're going to have to go back. Do you recall which exhibit? I think it was the first one that you testified to. 123. Thank you. Judge, could I uh, republish this? You may. Please? Can you see that, Detective? Yes. I also looked at it right in front of you on the screen. Yeah, yeah that's actually better. <laughs> Okay, so will this exhibit help you answer the question I just asked, which was specifically about December 27, 2009, 12.56 p.m.? That she received an incoming phone call from Logan McQuarrie. And Elizabeth Johnson would have been either at or around the Tornado bus station at that time. She was using utilizing Tower 82, which is in the vicinity of the Tornado bus company. And uh, you're familiar with... Uh, much of the rest of the investigation in this case? I think there's probably a lot I don't know, but I, I do know bits and pieces of a lot of it. Are you familiar enough to uh, testify that that call uh, was indeed recorded by Logan McQuarrie? I don't know that. I, okay. I never listened to any recorded phone All calls right. by Logan McQuarrie. Fair enough. At um, 1258, two minutes later, there's another phone call from Logan McQuarrie to Elizabeth Johnson. Do you recall that? I see that, yes, I recall that. Okay, and again, uh, same place that was uh, Tower 82? Yes. At or around the Tornado bus station? Yes. Is that accurate? Close to the tor tor Tornado bus station. Right, and then there's a series of calls. I think you testified about 30 calls that uh, occur from about 1.08 p.m to 1.21 p.m. Is that accurate? Yes. And would it be accurate to say uh, those calls... Well, actually, there was a question about that. 30 calls, uh, they were 15 seconds or less. Remember that testimony? Correct. And that was, in your estimation, likely because the phone that was being called was either off or dead. Uh, I believe, yeah, that they were in such short durations like that indicate the phone was off. Okay, and so that's a reasonable conclusion based on the evidence that you have? Uh, yes. And would it be accurate to conclude also that during those calls, uh, Elizabeth Johnson, assuming she's the person holding the phone, is traveling eastbound through Texas? Can you repeat that again? Would it be accurate to conclude from the evidence that during those calls, Elizabeth Johnson is traveling eastbound through Texas. Yeah, I, I would believe that's probably happening. And with the uh, information you know about the investigation... They occur... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Finish your answer, please. Uh, I was just going to say that those 30 outbound calls occurred in a, in a span of, what, 11, uh, 12 minutes. And assuming that she was on a moving bus at that time headed for Miami, then I would say she was traveling either north-northeast or east down I-10 towards Texas. Or, uh, right, and you sort of anticipated my next question. Based on everything you know, I don't think you testified about it on direct. At that time, she would have been, would it be reasonable to conclude at that time, she was on a bus traveling from San Antonio to Miami? From the phone records itself? No, given everything you know about the investigation. I believe that to be accurate. That's that's likely the case, right? I believe that to be true. Okay. And then, in fact, a little bit later at 3.10 p.m., you have this sort of Internet access, uh, even further eastbound Texas, right? Uh, what time did you say that? 3.10. Yes. More evidence that she's traveling eastbound yes. from Texas on the move. Yes. Do have a moment, Judge? At 2.52 p.m that you testified to uh, that was received by Elizabeth Johnson, assuming she was the one holding the phone, uh, placed by Detective Lenzen. That is correct, and I think in that particular case, we can say that Elizabeth Johnson was holding the phone. Okay, because she was talking to Detective right. Lenzen. Right. And so at 2.52 p.m., 
during the time Elizabeth Johnson is talking to Detective Lindzen, would it be accurate to conclude she's on the bus to Miami? I would conclude that, yes. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Redirect? No, redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Does the jury have any questions for Detective Harris before we let him go? Doesn't look like it. May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, Judge.